You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go! Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Andrew Carnegie and says, if you want to be happy, set a goal that commands your thoughts, liberates your energy, and inspires your hopes. Our guest today is an enormously successful entrepreneur who succeeded in about the toughest market a new business owner could enter. But what I love most about her is her confidence, spirit, and commitment to making the world a better place through everything she does. Gail Becker's career has spanned media, politics, and business, during which time she has held executive roles at Warner Brothers, Edelman, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As the mother of two boys with celiac disease, Gail grew tired of searching for healthier alternatives that were easy to make and also tasted great. So in 2017, knowing she couldn't be alone in this pursuit, Gail farewelled the corporate world and launched Collie Power. The company has been named one of Nielsen's breakthrough innovators and in a few short years is now generating more than 100 million US dollars in annual revenue. Collie Power is America's number one cauliflower crust pizza, number one gluten-free pizza, and one of the top pizza brands in the market. Not bad for someone launching their first business. Today, the company continues to expand into various categories, including chicken tenders, pasta, and riced cauliflower, and is available in 30,000 stores and 5,000 restaurants in the U.S. alone. Driving it all is Gail's mission to eliminate the need for consumers to ever have to choose between taste, health, and convenience ever again. In this episode, we talk about the number one thing to do to succeed as a first-time business owner, how to get a yes in the most important negotiations in your life, why a lack of knowledge about an industry can be the greatest gift, and how to build a movement from your passion project. You're going to love Gail's energy, not to mention her incredible business insights. Plus, she's got a special delicious treat just for the Win the Day community, so stay tuned for that. Before we begin, applications are closing very soon for the Day One Mastermind. If you'd like to join my inner circle and have me and some very special friends of mine in your corner for three months to 10x your influence, income, and impact, click the link in the show notes. There's only a few spots left, so get in fast. Again, click the link in the show notes to learn more about the Day One Mastermind. It'll blow your mind, guaranteed. Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, strap yourself in. Let's win the day with Gail Becker. Gail, it is great to see you. Thanks so much for coming on the Win the Day show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, when do you recall first being fascinated or intrigued with the idea of entrepreneurship? Were you the lemonade stand on the corner type of person or was it much later in your career? It's such a good question. Um, I think I first became intrigued with it when I used to work in my dad's store. He, um, starting at five years old, I used to ring the cash register and I really saw him build his business. And I didn't realize at the time, uh, but he would take me on sales calls as the business evolved and so forth. And um, it gave me a really good perch from which to watch entrepreneurship, sort of small business unfold. And the interesting thing is, even though I had the bug, it wasn't something that I, I felt I could do. Like the world sort of told me, oh, you need to be a doctor. You need to be a lawyer. Like nobody was, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Um, it wasn't cool then, to be honest with you. And so It wasn't until, even though I might have gotten the spark when I was much younger, because I was five years old working in my dad's store, I actually didn't listen to it until much later in life. Yeah, it's amazing how much kids actually uh, pick up. My daughter's two years old, and wow, I tell you what, you know you've done something wrong as a parent when you hear it repeated back to you in the voice of a two-year-old, so (laughs) what they they pick up is, is crazy. 
Exactly. They're listening. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And your your journey, I mean, you had this dissatisfaction with the corporate world. And I think yeah. anyone around the world can relate to that. I mean, first of all, the grass is always greener. But anyone who has held a, a corporate job knows it can be very, very challenging to, to yeah. have that motivation. Yeah. And it seems like that's yeah. when the, the seeds of the Collie Power journey were, were first sown for you. Is, is there a particularly frustrating day that you can recall from your corporate days that's still so vivid for you today? I don't know that it's a day per se, but there is an image. I distinctly remember I, I sort of worked my way up to the executive committee of the company. And I distinctly remember sort of sitting around the table and I looked a little bit different than a lot of the folks at the table. And I, you know, thought slightly different than some of the folks at the table. And I realized, although some of them to this day, I'm still quite close to, that others, I was just very different. And I felt like I wanted different things out of life. And I remember, and this is a good clue, I remember not caring. I remember sort of hearing some of the news and the updates and the new wins or what have you. And I remember sort of thinking, I don't really care anymore. And when you stop caring, that's a, that is a moment when you have got to make a change. Yeah, definitely. And I think a big problem with that corporate world and that corporate path is that people feel like they have to put in those reps and always stay behind those other people. And you might have that realization or that awakening that people who might be one, two, or three or four, or even more rungs above you mightn't have any more abilities than you. And in fact, you actually might have a lot better expertise than they do in some areas. And the ability to get out of that linear path and go mm -hmm. and do something of your own can be enormously liberating for you. You know, it's very well said, and I'm, I'll, I'll add a corollary to that. And that is, you know, I felt a bit of pressure because I felt that people were watching, like young women were watching. I worked really hard to get where I was. And I felt like if I sort of chucked it all away, what message was I sending to, you know, other women who were like just starting their climb up the ladder or, you know, along the jigsaw puzzle or what have you. And, um, and I was really concerned about that. It did it while it didn't influence my ultimate decision. I can't say it didn't influence my sort of timing. Yeah, and here you are now, you get to inspire a whole new younger generation of women like my daughter and things as well, which is super inspiring. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy at least that you had uh, made that decision to, to go and tread your own path. Uh, you that's, obviously had a lot of... Yeah, you obviously had a lot of success in that corporate career beforehand. You've had enormous success as an entrepreneur. Uh, are you much of a reader? Were, were there any like one or two books that, that stand out that contributed most to the, the mindset you, you have today? Yeah, I mean, there were a couple. I think I read Shoe Dog or, or some other sort of, you know, journey stories. But it was really this book that I read about, sounds so silly, but about the grocery industry, <laughs> which I thought... Which, couldn't put it down. <laughs> I couldn't put it down. Was no, it really was very good and sort of not just sort of the origins of the grocery industry, but the impact that food has on people. And it was sort of my realization that I could do something that would really make an impact on people's lives, that could really make people's lives better in some way. And it would just sort of talked about the food, the role that food plays in society. And that just really stuck with me. I mean, you know, food played a role in my household starting when I was just a little kid. It was always held a place of great value. My parents are both children of war and, 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 you know, food was not only valuable, but it was the way that you showed someone that you love them. But all these things are little sort of little seeds that someone sprinkled along the path that I didn't really see until I got to this end of the path and looked back and thought, oh, this was what I was supposed to do all along. If only someone had told me. Yeah, it's like that Steve Jobs quote. You can never connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking exactly, back. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, well, take us into the moment when you recognize for the first time that there might be a legitimate business when you were doing Collie Power rather than it just being more of a, a passion project. I wish I could say I did oodles and oodles of research. <laughs> I did do some. 
Okay. I really did do some. And the moment actually happened in my kitchen when I made a cauliflower crust pizza uh, off the internet. There were 569,000 recipes. By the way, that was the first and only time I've ever made a cauliflower crust pizza. Many people think I've made like hundreds and, you know, (laughs) sold it in the farmer's market. No, I made it one time. And it wasn't until my son said to me, "Hmm, can you make it? Mom, have you thought about making that again? And my visceral reaction was, there's no way, because it took 90 minutes to make a pizza crust after I got home from a full day of work. And it wasn't until then that I started looking for it. And it was like this sort of frustration and like looking online, looking in stores, not being able to find it. And sort of this aha moment when I thought, hmm, I can't be the only one that thinks that 90 minutes is too long to make a pizza crust. And that's what started me to do the research and started me saying, you know what, maybe I'm not the only one. And that's what really started the journey. Oh, it's so good. I love that. And what was your intention when when you launched Collie Power? Did you have any metrics that would define uh, success for you? Well, I can tell you none of the metrics are exemplified today. I mean, I suppose. So did I think Collie Power would be as big as it is today? No way. Absolutely not. In fact, one of these days I have to look back to an early business plan because I'm pretty sure that I tried to articulate what some of those metrics might be. And I can tell you I was way off. But I guess in my own mind, I thought, you know, it would be great if I could be self-sufficient, if, you know, I could send my kids to school and pay for everything that they needed and you know help people along the way really and and those were those aren't the metrics that you sort of graduate from business school with but they are the metrics that i used uh in order to sort of convince me to go on this crazy ride yeah purpose driven is a bit different to maximizing shareholder value (laughs) both are important both are important uh but both serve different purposes (laughs) It never sees, at least in my own life, relationships have been absolutely everything. You were starting this new business. I think one of the biggest challenges for founders in an industry like you were in, and obviously are still in, is that you don't know what you don't know. Were there one or two relationships that were really instrumental to you in in having the growth and being able to continue moving forward at a time when perhaps a lot of founders in the food industry might have uh, fallen off? Well, it's interesting. You know, when I started in food and I had zero experience other than I cooked it, bought it, and ate it. There was, I literally knew, and I knew a lot of people and I worked in business. I was consulting to many large companies. So I did, you know, I was exposed to a number of different fields. I literally knew one person in the food business, one. And uh, it was the day that I started the business when I called her and I put my two sons down at the table because I wanted them to serve as witnesses. And I called her And I said, hey, I have a crazy idea. Do you think that that I could do this? And she said, I don't think it's so crazy of an idea. And it was like that immediate validation that was, oh, really? And then, so, you know, I had hired a lot of people after that to sort of teach me bits of the business and consultants and so forth. But, you know, there were two people along the way, both buyers, at large retailers who were cheering me on, who would sort of, who sort of knew that I was like feeling my way through the dark and would give me tips or, you know, tell me, oh, maybe you should do it like this or send me an email without copying everyone else. So they wouldn't expose my sort of, you know, naivete. And it was amazing. One was named Larry and one was named Mary. So I always say, you know, hail to the Larry's and Mary's of the world. <laughs> Because sometimes there's people out there who really are cheering for the David rather than the Goliath. And it became so crystal clear to me. And I am incredibly grateful to this day. Yeah, it's an amazing journey. And that passion that you have had and that purpose-driven um, mindset, it's clearly resonated and enabled you to attract the right people and, and the right situations along the way, which is so great. And your, your customers, they were very much the, the major retailers, weren't they? And it was those major retailers that had your audience in, in droves. They had thousands and, and tens of thousands of customers. Um, so the stakes were super high in any of those conversations with those major retailers. 
For people who are faced with a situation where one conversation that they're having with someone, their version of a major retailer that could be potentially life-changing for them, is there any tips that you have for people to get closer to a yes in those conversations when it comes to things like uh, negotiations? You know why? It's such a, gosh, it's such a good question. And I'm going to refer back to something that I started with, and that was working at my dad's store, uh, ringing the cash register. And I literally sat on a stool for $20 a day plus lunch. And what I learned there and later drew upon is, you know, my father was a child of war, never, never even went to high school, let alone college. But he spoke eight languages and he was masterful at building relationships. And he knew all of his customers by name and he would build relationships with them and he would ask how they were and he would give them free things. And he, if someone was having a hard time, he wouldn't have them pay for it. And all of these little tiny things that I learned along the way. And even interestingly enough, he used to sell like food, at one point he sold food to like hotels and restaurants around San Francisco, he would always talk to the cooks and he would always talk to the bus boys and he would, oh, and the waiters. And he would always talk to the people who were actually working with the food. And that was really, you know, one of those things that were planted in my brain a long time ago. But, you know, even though they're a big buyer and even though they may have your future in their hands, they're human. And there's more goodness than bad. And they want someone to build a relationship with, you know, otherwise the job can get pretty tedious, like all of our jobs. So I, I really tried to just take the time and build relationships and ask them about their lives and, you know, find out about their kids or what was it they like to do outside of work. And, you know, did it make the difference? I don't know. Did it help? Yeah, probably did. Yeah, I think you have that energy, which clearly has come down from that emphasis that, that your father had put on relationships that you observed from a young age. And there's the there's the Frank Abagnale book, Catch Me If You Can, which they made into the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and, and mm -hmm. Tom Hanks. And in that, they with great movie, great book. In that, they talk about the reason for fraud, like the number one reason for fraud was human error. There's always humans mm -hmm. behind all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, even though you might be dealing with a brand like a Whole Foods or, yeah. or Target or whoever it might be, ultimately there is a human behind that. And that exactly. is your opportunity if you're great at relationships to make people feel like they matter and to, to get that foot in the door. Exactly, exactly, well said. How have you continued to, to raise the bar as your company has grown from, from strength to strength? Obviously, a lot of um, companies can go under if the founder doesn't grow with the business. Have you got like your, your own goal setting process or is there anything specific you do to make sure that you're getting out of your comfort zone on a regular basis? Boy, I mean, I, I'm out of my comfort zone every second, including right now, by the way. <laughs> um, I would say that I like to listen and I like to learn. And so I learn. I try to create a culture where it's okay to say you don't know something, and it's really good to say you just learned something, and it's really good to help other people learn things. And you know, I think maybe because of my age, I'm not afraid to say what I don't know. Right? I'm the founder, but I don't have to have all the answers. I've hired lots of smart people, much smarter than I, in their you know various areas of expertise. And um, you know, I'd be pretty stupid if I hired such smart people and didn't listen to what they had to say uh, and foster that environment. And so I'm like a sponge. I, I have been since day one, and I and I still very much am today. Yeah, Barbara Corcoran, when I interviewed her for my book, Thinking Grow Rich, The Legacy, um, Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank, and she had mentioned the huge realization for her was when she recognized that you could build an empire off someone else's know-how rather than needing to, to huh. know everything yourself. Very much that that Henry Ford mentality that you, exactly. you can have the, yeah, the row of buttons on the table where you don't need the answer right now, but you can push a button and get the best answer in the world. Exactly. Very, very exactly. That's right. And anyone who wants to, to scale an enterprise like you have needs to be able to, to duplicate their expertise. And I, I think that was interesting when you mentioned that you'd, you'd only made one of those cauliflower pizza crusts before. Clearly, there are other people involved now doing a lot of the, the yes. legwork. How did you overcome that doing everything yourself mindset that so many solopreneurs get caught up with? So you were able to build a team. You were able to duplicate your expertise and, and you could scale your business and, and obviously enjoy the freedom and benefits from that today. 
Well, look, I mean, particularly because I was entering a industry that I knew nothing about. I mean, I might as well have entered the copper pipe industry, right? Because I knew nothing about what they, all of the ins and outs of the industry. Although unlike copper pipes, pipes, I love food. I love cooking. I love feeding. Um, and so it wasn't that part of it was, it came fairly naturally, but um, I hired a lot of people, a lot of consultants, a lot of experts in the field, not even full time, but just to sort of, you know, teach me the ropes, teach me me sort of the the industry. I hired someone to help me find someone to make frozen pizza at scale. I didn't know how to find a manufacturer. And by the way, it was really hard to find a manufacturer because, you know, here was this crazy woman from California with lots of curly blonde hair who said, oh, I want to make a pizza crust out of cauliflower. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, lots of people turned me down because remember, we created the category. So there was no cauliflower crust. So you could just imagine these manufacturers who've been making frozen pizza the same way, you know, for the past, I don't know how many years. I mean, be be better California than Texas, maybe at least that'd be a little bit more accommodating. Well, perhaps I didn't even look in California because for manufacturing, you really want to hit the center of the country mm. uh, because Access it's, much to both. Yeah. Yeah, it's much cheaper distribution and shipping. So um, uh, it was, uh, boy, some of those days that, you know, they looked at me like I had three eyes, but um, you know, all's well that ends well. I, I finally found one and sort of the rest is history. But um, I think to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to not be afraid to admit what you don't know and be willing to learn it from others. Yeah, it sounds like it's been the superpower of your entire journey is is, uh, is that awareness of what you don't know and, and not being egotistical enough to not surround yourself with those people to get the result. Exactly. Like at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We'll be back with the show shortly. Before we do, I've got a quick question for you. How would your life change if you had me and a hand-picked team of high-level entrepreneurs working with you for not one month, not two months, but three months to take your business and brand to the next level? That's right, this February, I'm hosting my signature program, The Day One Mastermind, to help entrepreneurs like you 10X your income, influence, and impact. If you run your own business or are thinking about starting your own business, this will change your life like nothing else. I'll be sharing the exact secrets that have got me featured on more than 600 podcast, radio, and television shows, published in more than 10 languages, and connected with some of the most influential individuals and companies on the planet. Above all, I'll be showing you how to crack the code to scaling your income without scaling your workload. If you want to learn more about the Day One Mastermind and to hear from some of the people who have joined previously, go to thedayone.com, thedayone.com, or click the link in the show notes. And I mentioned a handpicked team of high-level entrepreneurs, but who are they, I hear you ask? These are people like Janine Shepard, who will be showing you how she's amassed almost 1 billion views online. She'll also be working with you to personally book, deliver, and leverage a TED Talk of your own. There's Josh Henry Hicks, who has facilitated almost $1 billion in ad spend, helped more than 40 brands get acquired or raise their next round of funding, and worked with some of the most successful disruptor brands in the world. Josh will be showing you how to sell, scale, and stand out on social media. That's just two of the special guests, and we've got a bunch more waiting to help you, and their mission is simple, to help you 10x your income, influence, and impact. There's more than $100,000 in value throughout this mastermind, plus some epic bonuses, not to mention unlimited access to me personally for three months. You'll even get a chance to be interviewed on my top-rated Win The Day podcast. That's right, the show you're listening to right now and given a bunch of assets that you can use to grow your brand. And if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I love going above and beyond. We're even throwing in a special one-on-one -on -one game plan session, just you and me this December, to make sure you can build some momentum before the mastermind officially begins in February and start getting you some big results as soon as possible. So if you're ready to take your business and brand to the next level and want to join my inner circle, there's no better way. Go to thedayone.com or click the link in the show notes. But you better be quick because there's only 12 spots available and applications are closing very soon. One more thing that I mentioned, the results are guaranteed. 
That's right, results are guaranteed. For every single person who participates, I personally guarantee massive results, or you can choose to have a full refund, or I'll work with you one-on-one -on -one for free until you do. The choice is yours. You won't find a better guarantee than that anywhere on the planet, and you'd never experience growth like you'll experience in the day one mastermind. Again, only 12 spots are available and applications are closing soon. Relationships have made all the difference in my life and I'm excited to give you an express path to achieving everything you want. Go to thedayone.com or click the link in the show notes. You'll be asked a few questions to make sure you're a good fit for the group and we'll go from there. All right, let's get back into the show. Uh, you launched this business in an extremely challenging category in an extremely competitive space. It's, it seems crazy. This journey is is amazing. I'm I'm so proud of you, and I I love talking to you and being you uh, with you here today. But it is a very very difficult thing that you have been able to do. Now that you you can allow a little bit of retrospection, what's been the most difficult part of that entire business journey? The journey has not gone like this. It's not like there's ups and downs of the journey. Every day is ups and downs, right? Every day, something bad happens. Every single day, there's something, there's a problem, there's an issue every, from day one of the industry. Um, I like how you commented on the challenge of this particular industry, the frozen food industry, particularly frozen pizza. You know, in that respect, I would say ignorance is bliss because to be honest with you, I didn't know that the frozen section was the most challenging part of the grocery store. And it's the most challenging because there's the most limited space. I didn't really know that every pizza in the pizza section was made by a, you know, multinational, you know, multi-billion dollar corporation. I sort of knew, but not really. Um, and so in some respects, you have to figure out what rules you're going to make and what rules you're going to and follow and what rules you're going to break. And for me, it would have been really easy for someone to talk me out of it, for someone to say, are you nuts? You, you're entering the most competitive part of the grocery store in the most competitive door of the freezer aisle. And if they had to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't have done it. I guess that's a long way of saying for me, and again, everybody has to do it their way. But for me, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. I just did it. I didn't tell my friends. There were maybe five people in my life, my close family, maybe one friend who knew. And the reason I didn't do that is because I didn't want people to tell me that I couldn't do it. I didn't want people to say how crazy it is. And I love how you articulated it because it really was crazy. Like now people say, oh my gosh, that was so smart. It was probably the stupidest thing I could have ever done. <laughs> um, and thank God I did. I think in some respects, a little bit of ignorance and a little bit of shelter from all the naysayers in the world, it's not such a bad thing. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes is from the, I feel like I've shared too many quotes with you today. Oh, I love, oh my gosh, I love <laughs> quotes. No, please, I need all of them I can get. Yeah, action is the real measure of intelligence. So simple, so succinct, action is the real measure okay. of intelligence. You went out there and you had that action and actually a massive theme of the Win the Day podcast from, from the guests who come on, amazing change makers and people doing really cool things is the gift of beginner's mind. It's almost like the more you know, the more you've been tainted, the more you've been corrupted in it, and it will stop you from taking that necessary action. Whereas mm -hmm. having that beginner's mind and not knowing about those things that you can do means that you fail, you fail fast. And as a result of that, you have the resourcefulness and the resilience to be able to ultimately make that thing a big success. Oh, I love that. I completely agree with that philosophy. Absolutely. But it's a fine line, right? Because you can't go into it too ignorant. You can't go into it. But but execution is the day. Like everybody has a great idea. Everybody has a great idea. Great ideas are a dime a dozen. I can't tell you how many people came up to me. I haven't come up to me over the years. I thought about me. I thought about making a cauliflower crust pizza company. But the idea is like this part of it. It's all in the execution. Yeah, so true. It's so true. Uh, it sounds like you had a lot, an interesting part of your journey from the outside looking in. It sounds like you had a lot of industry support along the way. Uh, if that was the case, why didn't the big incumbent players, and maybe it was just different parts of the industry who, who loved you and other parts maybe didn't love you as much, uh, how come those big incumbent players didn't just allocate all their, their resources to, to crushing you as soon as, you, as soon as they were aware of, of how big you were starting to get? It's such a good 
question. And it's one that I ask myself all the time. These big multinational, you know, big food as it lovingly referred to, they have so much money, so much resources, so many people working in R&D. How did I come up with it? I took the time to listen. And I think what I listened to is that here were all these people, a lot of women, but people were so frustrated by not finding better for you options in the grocery store that they resorted to spending 90 minutes to making it themselves. And I don't know if the people working in the labs or in R&D or whatever, I don't know if they work through those trials and tribulations. I don't know if they've been a working mom like me who like comes home and tries to make dinner in like, you know, 15.7 minutes. Um, I don't know. But, uh, but boy, you know, obviously, you know, we were the first. Now, lots of competition has come in. It took them a while to see, oh, is this crazy idea going to take off? And I think it surprised everybody from what I understand. Um, is this crazy idea going to take off? And then they started coming in droves. I mean, 50 different SKUs from 17 different brands, all having a cauliflower crust. Like several years after us but all doing it and some executions being better than others. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? This uh, channeling the competition uh, rather than worrying so much about what they're doing. You can just channel everything into strengthening the customer experience, making sure your, your product and product range continues to get better and better. Uh, on, on the flip side of that question I asked before, what are you now doing uh, to continue Collie Power going from strength to strength to stop these emerging players like you once were from taking yeah. a big bite out of your market share? Well, it's interesting because the competition has really come from two places. It's come from, you know, some stock startups, as you say, but it's also come from a lot of the big companies who've decided to, you know, enter the fray because they, they've seen the success of the category. And, um, Fortunately for Collie Power, executions have been really bad. And what I think I see a lot of is that a lot of people in the traditional food industry sort of bet against the consumer. They don't think that the consumer is going to know any better. At Collie Power, we bet on the consumer. I know that consumer is going to know better. I know he or she is going to taste the difference. And that's why we put, you know, as, as I always say in real estate, it's location, location, location. In food, it's taste, taste, taste. And it doesn't matter how healthy you make something, how much better for you you make something. If it doesn't taste good, nobody's going to eat it. And I think with some fast followers, people forgot that. And so what happened last year is the category exploded because the retailers thought, oh, I'm just going to bring in all these SKUs and then that'll be incremental and we'll make that much more money. But what they decided is that it was totally cannibalistic. And so now all the SKUs that they brought in, they're now deleting because they just didn't perform. Yeah, I guess a, a frozen product can't be sitting around Whole Foods forever. <laughs> Because cannot, in, in cannot. That, that space is, you know, really valuable. Yeah. And, and the innovation that you've had with the company is great. I know that's been a really big focus for you, especially during COVID. And uh, I, I heard you mention previously what you do. It sits at the intersection of taste, health and convenience. Obviously, taste being uh, very, very important there. Uh, can you give us a play by play of the most successful product innovation um, that you brought to market? If there's anything that immediately comes yeah, to mind? Other than pizza, I take it. Um, yeah, I, actually, I can. And just to even make it better, it happened by accident or it. <laughs> It happened as a result of a, of a problem. Uh, so we used to have a baking mix at Culling Power. And it was out in market for a little bit. It was doing well. And then I heard from one of the ingredient suppliers, they, were, they couldn't make the ingredient anymore. And it, I'd have to be off shelf for six months, which is like a death now. And so I made the very hard decision that we were going to discontinue the baking mix. And so as a result, I had a couple of bags, you know, just for posterity sitting around. I couldn't part with them. So one night I was sort of playing around with it. I took some chicken, I coated it in the baking mix, and then I air fried it because I don't, you know, I don't like to fry food. So I air fried it and I served it to my family and they loved it. And they had no idea what they were eating. 
And so that was how our chicken tenders were born. And our chicken tenders are actually wildly successful. They're our number two product after pizza. And um, it was really born on a fail. So, you know, sometimes even the failures, a wonderful success. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. R&D budget of zero. No, one, no one's going to complain <laughs> with that. <Just> literally zero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a pretty health conscious person, uh, especially having having kids. It is amazing yeah. to see how a lot of unscrupulous food companies manipulate packaging and and ingredients to appear healthy or or try and um, you know a whole bunch of different things. Is there anything in particular um, from those big corporate food manipulations that you were specifically trying to steer clear of? One hundred percent. I was a consumer way before I was a, you know, the manufacturer. And when I took a look at the industry and I was looking at frozen pizza, I was like stunned and also angry that like a serving size of a pizza was like one fifth or like one slice. Uh, or I've even seen some one eighth of a pizza uh, as a serving size. And I thought, that is ridiculous. Who eats one piece of pizza? Nobody. <laughs> so when we started calling power, we were the first ones, I think, to make a serving size half a pizza. And I cannot, and to me, it was just perfectly logical because that's how I'd like to see some. And that's how I eat. And that's how my family eats. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me over the years and say, thank you for putting an actual real life serving size uh, on the box. Uh, because again, consumers know this. So um, that's just one example, but it's such a real life one. Yeah, it's so great. You know, one thing that I share with my clients all the time is that every single touch point is an opportunity to either build trust or lose trust. And it's exactly yes. what you're doing there. Even if yes. it might make you seem worse immediately by comparison, it's an opportunity that you have built trust with that potential consumer. I mean, the customer lifetime value of one person is going to be extensive once you can create that uh, relationship based on integrity with them. Well said, well said. My father always used to say, uh, you know, well, obviously everybody always says the customer's always right, but my father used to live it. Like mm. someone would make a return, never ask a question. And, you know, that's our philosophy at Collie Power. Even the customer is never wrong. Even when they're wrong, they're right. Mm. So, uh, you know, and that's really the philosophy. And we've gotten so many compliments on our um, customer service, which, you know, I have a feeling my dad's looking down and smiling when he sees that. <laughs> I'm sure he is. Uh, if, if Collie Power had not been the mega success it is today, could you have gone back to the corporate world or would you have tried to, to stay in the entrepreneurial world and maybe start a different, a different business? Wow, that's a really good question. Because um, given that there's like a lot of the entrepreneurs that I've mentioned that I've experienced myself, it's a form yeah. of PTSD with, with yeah. what can go wrong in, that, in, the, in the business world. I mean, even oh if it goes God. right, you can, you can I, lose a big part of you along the, along the way. I have definitely lost a big part of it. I think I've aged like 10, you know. <laughs> 20 years in, in five, but um, yeah, I would like to think that I wouldn't have gone back. I really want to think that. I hope that's true. I guess I'll never know, but I was really ready. <laughs> I was ready and I, you know, and even in the early days and still now, you know, I always say, just make it would to whomever's listening, just make it so I never have to go back. That's all I care about. <laughs> that sounds like a good metric of success. Exactly, exactly. Uh, if if, if you were sitting down, right. Yeah. If, if you were sitting down with a solopreneur who wanted to create a seven, eight, nine figure business of their own, what, what steps would you take them through first of all, or, or what things would you share with them to get them prepared and, and capable of, of making that? Well, I would say, you know, obviously know the market, know the industry, you know, get expert help. Even if, I mean, I just paid people by the hour, literally, and just had, I hired one guy to take me in the grocery store and show me just how things arrive at the shelf, because I had no idea. Beg, borrow, and steal your way to get information. And, uh, you know, and I did a lot of bartering, right? I, I bartered everything I had. Um, to try and, you know, uh, to get help with the packaging, to understand the business, to, um, you know, free pizza for life for our employment lawyer, you know, all kinds of things. I still barter, right? I give free pizza coupons to everyone I see. It's okay to, you know, enter an industry that you don't know much about. Obviously, I'm, I'm living proof, but you also have to be really comfortable in saying what you don't know and, and be really willing to learn it. 
Mm. Yeah, that awareness of your limitations is is huge, and obviously having a lot of faith and conviction in your own abilities and, and your own opinion. Once you've, of course, done your due diligence, yeah. so important. <laughs> and, and and know what your white space is, right? Have a really good, healthy look at the market. What's working? What's not? How is how is your product or service going to be different? Is it going to be cheaper? Is it going to be better? Is it going to be more, uh, you know, more luxurious? Is it going to taste better? Whatever it is, there has to be some white space. You can be a me too. You know, some there's a lot of successful me too products out there that are just the same product but better marketed. And there's a lot of really great marketed products out there that are pretty lousy. So, you know, just know what it is, what benefit are you offering the consumer and what is that white space in the category you're entering? Yeah, there's a good friend of mine, uh, Michael Fox, a guy in Australia who has actually been on the show before. Um, he was based in the US for a while. He had a company called Shoes of Prey, which was the world's oh. first yeah, female custom shoe line, had more than 20 really? or $30 million in funding. Yeah, they ended up going under, unfortunately, but his new business called Fable Food Co. in Australia, it's a meat alternative. They make um, products out of out of mushrooms. Like they want to be the- Oh, I love it. Yeah, they want to be the antithesis of like um, the beyond things that have got a lot of filler stuff in them. They 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 make it with like shiitake mushrooms and they've now got thousands and thousands of, of stores they're in in Australia and, and starting to expand. It was a partnership actually with Heston Blumenthal, but- Oh, why yeah, why I bring that up is because he literally, after all of his, his amazing business experience beforehand, for this new venture, he would literally stand in the, the refrigerated section of the supermarket with a pen and paper and talk to customers who bought meat. And he would say to them, why are you buying meat rather than this meat alternative? So good. And he would so talk good. to the meat alternative people and say, why are you buying that instead of meat? Because he realizes that he needs to get them uh, to convert people who are already enjoying meat. His meat alternative product needed to be closer to meat to increase that category. Oh, I love it. I love it. And, and, and did people help him? Did people answer? Yeah. Yeah. He had a whole bunch of different things and uh, yeah, doing amazing things now. So um, yeah, he, he's That's doing awesome. great. And it's like oh, that, that, that. Yeah. It's like that hustle mentality and, and doing the, the not having being having too much ego to do that um, market research and things yourself, I think is, is so important. So um, important. Yeah. Before we move into the rocket round, I got one last question I, I would love yeah. to ask you on your best day. What's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day? Wow, you're really good at this, aren't you? Um, people have sent us cards and letters and emails and notes about how cauliflower saved them in a pinch or how we're their kid's favorite pizza or thank you because I wasn't able to eat pizza before or thank you because now everybody eats the same thing. And um, I read every single one. And I have a number, uh, you know, covering my office. And, you know, anytime I, I look at one of those, it's, uh, I always get cheered up. Oh, so good. Well, let's now move to the win the day rocket round. 10 questions for some quick answers. You ready for this one, okay. Gail? Okay, quick. Okay, got it. <laughs> number one, what quote inspires you the most? Okay, well, this is hard because I have two. Um, and it was one that I discovered along the way. The other one has always been a favorite, but this one's one I discovered along the way. And it's by Paul Coelho. And it says, can I read it here? Yeah, it absolutely. Says, uh, maybe the journey isn't so much about becoming anything. Maybe it's about unbecoming everything that isn't really you so that you can be who you were meant to be in the first place. Oh, oh that's good. Mic drop. Isn't it we don't even have to do the rest, right? That's right. Just like that. Isn't that good though? Oh. It's, it is about, um, because especially if you're of a certain age, like I don't have, I don't have to be all those things that I thought I had to be. I can unbecome them and really be who I was meant to be. Oh. You know, I think anyone who's a parent particularly will really resonate with that. You look at kids who were yes. born without these limitations and they'll, they'll do anything and everything. That's such a great one. Exactly. Oh, good. Yeah. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Do I have to choose? No, both is a very common answer. Because <laughs> I, I believe in, I believe strongly in both. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Uh, number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Don't wait for a sign. Number four. I spent too much of my life waiting. Yeah, don't wait for yeah. a sign. Yeah, that's great. Uh, number four, what book do you gift the most? When bad things happen to good people. Mm. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? When I was little... I had a very bad stuttering problem. 
of course I tried to hide it, but of course it was very hard to hide. And I worked really, really hard to get rid of it. And my mother helped me, you know, over the years. And now I feel, you know, I love speaking to people. I love, you know, speaking to large groups of people. So um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good example. Oh, that's so good. Uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? It is the best darn teacher out there. Mm. It certainly is. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Ellie Wiesel. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? No, I'd probably say, you know what I would say? I'd say um, social media, actually, because I do read every single comment that people make. Uh, I get a lot of direct messages from people. And I really feel like one of the reasons why Collie Power has been successful is because we listen to our consumers and they're very generous in their thoughts. And um, I probably, the company wouldn't be what it is today without, without that listening tool. Yeah. If you're listening, go and connect with Collie Power on the social, share the love. Gail's going to read it personally. So it's a great way of connecting with her and, and sharing that love. Uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Living in New York City. Number 10, final question. What's one thing you do to win the day? Talk to my kids. <laughs> it's a good reminder that as hard as work is sometimes, it's not everything. Yeah. Yeah. You got to remember what you're doing all the work for. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And because you're an amazing human, Gail, I believe you have a special treat for everyone listening today. Well, um, anybody who sends us a direct message at Collie Power, all they have to do is say win the day and they get a free coupon good for any free product of, of either our pizzas or chicken tenders or a new pasta anything all you have to do is send a note to uh at collie power and just say win the day how good is that thank you very much gail that sounds amazing if you'd like to learn more about collie power you can connect with them on instagram facebook and twitter at collie power visit their website eatcolliepower.com and spread the word at your favorite supermarkets and restaurants if you can't get there um, if you're one of the few places that don't have their amazing products available right now in your region again all of that and more will be linked in the show notes gail so great to see you thanks for coming on the win the day show so nice to be with you thank you so much I hope you enjoyed that interview with Gail. I mean, wow, what an incredible woman. As you heard, our guests love to hear positive feedback no matter where they're at in their careers. So share a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway from the show so Gail knows she made a difference in your life today. Applications are closing very soon for the Day One Mastermind. If you own a business or are thinking about starting a business and want me and some very special friends in your corner for three months, click the link in the show notes. You don't want to miss this one. That that's the day one mastermind. And if you're new to the Win The Day show, hit the subscribe button so you can get access to awesome episodes like this one as soon as they are released. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. And that might start with a delicious Collie Power pizza. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. Always.